Um, we're going to kick things off here. So good afternoon. Hope you're enjoying your wonderful lunches while you're listening to this uh, webinar here. So uh, on behalf of Graduate Professional Studies here at Brandeis University, we would love to welcome you to our special event webinar, Education is Open for Business. So thank you everyone so much for joining us during your lunch hours. Um, so before we begin, uh, we'd like to go over just a few tips for utilizing our communications platform. So you are currently in listen-only mode. You can raise your hand or send an emoticon using the icon at the top left of your screen. Uh, you can see the picture on the slide here shows an example. Uh, so right now I'd like to ask everyone to send a brief note through the chat box just to confirm that you can hear me, okay? All right, great. Uh, so at this time, feel free to type any questions you have during our session, and I'll try my best to answer them as we go along, because we'd like this session to be as interactive as possible. Uh, so now a little bit on our presenter this afternoon. Uh, Kevin Corcoran has been the Executive Director of the Connecticut Distance Learning Consortium since 2011. Uh, he joined the CTDLC in 1999 and has been responsible for developing and growing the products and services offered to support e-learning initiatives. Uh, Kevin received his BA in English from the University of Connecticut and his MBA with a specialization in technology management from Walden University. So now I'd like to hand it over to our presenter. Kevin, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Well, it's my pleasure and I'll try not to upset anybody while they're eating lunch. Um, I'll also make mention that I've had a long relationship with Brian Salerno and have had the fortunate um, uh, circumstances to be part of a, a, a program review group for in, the instructional design program for Brandeis. So um, thank you for taking your time. What I'd like to do today is have a conversation with you all. So if you have questions, feel free to, um, to chime in whenever you see fit. And I'd like to explore what open education resources are and why they may be important. So uh, in normal standards, I'd have a show of hands, but I'm just going to sort of just jump right in. So um, for the folks who don't know the, the official definition of OER, open education resources, or any teaching and learning resource that resides within the public domain and been re released on an intellectual property license. So what this means is that it is something that is freely available and has a license that supports your ability to use it and adapt it as you see fit. These OER resources can be a number of things. They can be full courses, which the state of Washington did with their top 100 uh, enrolled courses. It can be any component of course materials. You may have heard OER used in the context of textbooks, textbooks replacement, and we're going to touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. But I wanted to make sure that everyone understands that OER isn't just textbooks. It can be streaming videos, lectures, it can be test banks, it can be any educational materials that have been freely available with an open license for you to adopt or adapt as you see fit. So why do you care about this? Why am I being asked to, to speak to, to Brandeis today? Well, what we're seeing is a trend, and this conversation is 15, 20 years old now, of the preparedness for students, the ability for students to succeed. And when you think of the materials that are available, maybe commercially, you know, there are cost issues or cost factors that play in. So some of the questions that are asked are, do your students arrive first day with all their textbooks? Are they prepared for day one to start learning? The other question is, is the material that you've selected in the past fully appropriate? Do you use all the resources that you assign to your students? Are you happy with the materials that you have? The commercial entities don't have the ability to allow you to redefine based on the license structure. So if you're not happy, 100% happy, you're sort of stuck with the materials. And lastly, do we know that the students are, are that we have signed these materials, are they actually engaged in them? Are they using them? Are they having a positive output? So those are some of the broad questions that faculty ask when they're selecting any materials, whether it's commercial, open, what have you. 
So here are some of the, the, the broad pay based um, benefits of sort of exploring what open is. And, and I'll go into each one of these a little bit more detail, but again, with that open license that allows you to adopt and adapt the material, you have the ability to legally customize and contextualize any of the learning resources for your students. So I'm from Connecticut. I've always had this, this bone to pick is that when I do US history, there's some great stories about Massachusetts and everything from Paul Revere to what have you. But there's really not a lot about what Connecticut's role has been in the Revolutionary War or in the Civil War. So as a history teacher, what if I wanted to actually swap out a chapter or add a chapter into my US history textbook that really focuses on a Connecticut specific battle? Well, with this open material, I'd have the ability to edit or alter that material as I see fit. Additionally, if a student doesn't make a decision based on cost of textbook on whether or not that material is worth their investment, and it's embedded in your class or available freely, we no longer have to worry about students being prepared for day one. They'll have the materials there present, free of cost, and in a digital or printed format. And you also have the ability to engage students through a variety of learning opportunities. So you're not just stuck to a face-to-face -face piece. There are a number of resources that will show that can um, present different learning opportunities in an adjust-in-time format. And there's also the ability to collaborate with your colleagues, not only across the institution, across the region, but globally as well, because this is a, a international phenomenon. And Kevin, we actually have a question that just popped up from Stephen. He wants to know, in your understanding, are open education resources typically restricted to use by not-for-profit organizations, or can commercial organizations reuse OER to make money? We're going to touch on that in a little bit more detail, but the quick answer is that because of the open license, anyone can use this. So a commercial entity can adopt something that's been openly licensed unless the license structure forbids commercial use. Now there's a broader question, is that if resource A is offering this resource, if um, resource A is providing this textbook, which is openly licensed for free, and resource B is offering the same textbook for a commercial fee, which one are your students going to adopt? Which one of your, your faculty are probably gonna adopt? So if you can still get the same source material for free, there may not be a benefit to going to that commercial piece unless they're adding value added to that. But we're gonna come back to that a little bit more when we talk about the licensing structure. So just coming back to faculty benefits, I'm talking a little bit more about access and access to materials. Again, the context here isn't always about replacement. It can be supplement. You can use these open materials to supplement your existing um, instruction, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. You can also, as I mentioned, improve your, your day one readiness or student access. And this is one is what I find really interesting, this just-in-time materials within the confines of commercial bookstores where federal law has required folks identify whatever commercial textbooks that folks need to have during registration period. It somewhat prohibits you during the course of the, the semester to say, I'm going to change gears and I'm going to require X as a reading. Well, because it wasn't specified as a potential reading piece before registration, you know, federal law basically frowns upon that. But if you're using something that's open that is a digital format or even printed that's a zero cost, low cost piece, now you have the ability to change gears midterm to basically address what might be happening in current, current events. And just a reminder that these are peer reviewed materials, many times worked on in collaboration across an institution or across a region, and it has appropriate copyright. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about copyright later on in the presentation, but just because it's something available on the web and you can do a Google search doesn't mean that you actually have the permissions to use it in the form that you want to. And then in some ways, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, for, for, uh, improved marketability, the ability to attract more students because the students aren't necessarily spending their money or financial aid money on text, they might have a little bit more cash to reinvest in other for credit opportunities on campus. So around customization, again, the, depending on the licensing structure, you have the ability to 
make these resources contextually appropriate to what you want. You can revise to meet what your students' needs are. You can add that localization to it. You can unbundle from a publisher. So you can take separate chapters from multiple OER resources and you can use those independently of one another or you can combine them to create a new resource. So that's a, a remix, remix piece. And longer term piece, if you're talking about a redesign process for your course, if you're changing um, your practices or, or whatever the case may be, and you're looking at learning outcomes, you can actually use OER as specific pieces to address specific learning outcomes. You can, when you're addressing the activities that support your student learning, you can use these resources and not necessarily be bound to what the commercial provider is dictating. And lastly here, collaboration. It, it, utilizing OER ha, has the ability for you to really do this networking around innovation of teaching and learning. There is this global community that is supporting this. There are folks who are looking to partner, who are looking to go beyond their institution's own lens and really see what folks are doing across the globe, across the state, across the region. And the flip side here is you also get to promote anything that you've done. So if you've done something from the ground up, you have this whole community that's willing to be your beta or your QA folks, and you get to see folks across the globe adopting your work. So again, just to reinforce, you may have heard open education referred to as an open textbook initiative, and that is a lot of the focus nationally, or if not globally, but it's not the whole story. If you look at this chart here, you can see that many of the resources are not just textbooks. It's not until you get to the mid-tier that you start seeing textbook replacement or, or open textbooks as something as uh, a, a large consumption piece. It's really about images and videos. And then now in a higher rate is homework exercises, um, test pools, test banks, uh, supplemental material around that. So when we're talking OER, it doesn't have to always talk about textbook replacement. Now, the challenge that we have in the open community, and the reason why I'm more than willing to talk about this topic anywhere I can is that Quite frankly, there's about 65% of faculty across the, the, the nation that just don't know. Um, they may be doing something that's related to OER where they're gone textbook free in a particular course, or they've adopted things from Merlot or other repositories, but they're just not aware that they're doing that. But then there's a, a large population that just aren't aware that these resources are available to supplement their teaching and learning and have a benefit to the students, not only from a student success point, but from a student affordability point. So I would real be quick, remiss if I... Sure. Oops, sorry. Uh, just real quick, Stephen wanted to add the comment that the faculty awareness numbers are real eye openers. Oh, just wait, I've got some other eye openers coming up soon, I hope. So um, what... Thank you for that. And I would be remiss if I actually didn't address the elephant in the room, which is the student affordability piece to this. So just from a student context uh, around readiness, that a student could come in at any point in time and say, look, my textbook is backordered. It's in the mail. It's wrong edition. My student loan, I can't purchase it because my student loan hasn't arrived yet. It's not, I'm not going to purchase this book until I really decide that I'm going to do this, or unfortunately, this last one, I don't really see this textbook necessary until it's actually exam time. Let's hope that that's not your student body, but. So when we look at the context in the last decade, we look at the, the rise in cost te of textbooks in context to what the, raise, uh, the rate of inflation is. So textbooks have risen in cost triple the rate of inf inflation over the last 10 years. And it's not going to get any better anytime soon from a commercial standpoint. If we just look at the state of Massachusetts, excuse me, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a whole, so this is public and private, two-year and four-year institutions, your students on average have spent over $360 million per academic year. From a private standpoint, the private institutions in Massachusetts represent $173 million of that number. So your students are spending a good chunk of money on a yearly basis towards commercial textbooks. 
when we look at this from a national standpoint, and this was uh, a research that Florida did a couple of years back, it's on average, it's 60 percent of the students go through their academic experience at some point in time taking a full course without the required textbooks. So they're going in unprepared. They're not preparing. They're not planning on purchasing that textbook, and their student, their success in that course may or may not be impacted by the lack of this textbook. But for administrators who may be in the room, if you look down towards the bottom, 14 percent have dropped a course due to the textbook course, or 10 have withdrawn because of the textbook. So students are, and I know one, no one wants to hear this, but students are becoming consumers. They're looking at the value, they're looking at the cost, and they're making decisions based on that cost. This is lost tuition. So in that nutshell, hopefully we get folks to start thinking not only from the faculty benefit of this, but the institutional um, advantage or, or institutional sustainability and student affordability. Now, there's been a number of interesting projects that have been going on nationally, but one of them I want to just point out is Kaleidoscope. Um, the Kaleidoscope was a project that was funded by the, the Gates Next Generation Course Challenge a couple of years back, and it is now spun into an organization called Lumen Learning. They had some money to go in and address Common Core or Gen Ed requirements and really uh, go across, I think, 21 institutions across 15 different states in this. And the data that they got back is when they looked at revamping the materials to meet specific student needs against traditional textbooks, across the board, they were seeing student improvement. Now, I know this is somewhat of a controversial statement because um, student preparedness, faculty attitudes towards content, whether the student ate that day, there's so many factors that basically go into whether a student will perform or not. But there is a website. And it's called OpenEdGroup.org, and they have a full review project of studies that are specific of a control class where they're using this, the, the uh, vendor's textbook versus another uh, class where they are using OpenEd. It's the same teacher, and what they're doing is they're do both doing the same pretest, the same post-test, and the data keeps coming back that we are seeing student success, student improvement, by utilizing open resources that are contextualized to the student's need versus publisher textbooks that, and quite frankly, are written to the markets of California and Texas because they have the largest consumer population. So, you know, normally I would ask in a face-to-face -face for folks to raise their hand of who knows what their textbook costs their student. Now, there's a federal regulation on the on, on the sites that you know, publishers are supposed to allow faculty um, to uh, some awareness on what their textbook costs. But if we just look at a general psych book, and this may be dated, it's about $200 for a, a, a new textbook. So if you think about what other options are, well, you can think about renting. Okay, well, if we look at a rental price, it's about $100. And at the end of the three month period, when the semester is over, they no longer have that asset. So when you think about funda fundamental courses like math, where math skills build from time to time, there may be a need to keep those textbooks. For, so the rental piece, even at $100, is pretty steep for a limited time use. So what can you do? Well, you can explore a repository like Merlot. So Merlot is um, funded by the Cal State system. Cal State Fullerton um, was the, the brains behind this. And what they have is a repository of materials that are free of cost and are openly licensed and the kicker is they're peer reviewed so they actually have a rubric and they pay folks to go through and be a peer reviewer and and rate these in addition to the sort of the amazon shopping cart piece of a user rating and you can also see the number of collections and the number of downloads and you can review this now you can work with your bookstore if you need to, to basically fulfill this in a printed, binded, bound version if you want, but it's completely free if you adopt this as a, a digital resource. You can link back to this or you can take the resource and you can embed it into your learning management system. Now, if you really want to have a bound version, there's another um, initiative out of Rice University called OpenStax. Now, what they've done is they've focused on textbooks solely, not the full repository of different educational materials. And they've made an arrangement with most bookstores or they have printing um, services on themselves 
So for a fully color bound, professionally bound piece, for that same uh, psychology book that was nearly $200, you can have something shipped to you for about $38. And it's a, a, a roughly the same equivalency. And because OpenStax has a sustainability model in place where they have some third party tools and they also have grant funding, they have professional authors that are sustaining the content. So there is a high level of quality that is being invested in each one of these resources and these are being um, revised on a regular cycle. What you should know though is that there are advocacy groups out there. So in Connecticut we have uh, a PERG, a public interest research group that is a student action or student advocacy. So student advocacy groups have been focusing on student affordability in college. In this particular screen, you can see that there was a, a template letter to legislators to help address or at least become aware of what this rising textbook piece. And if you happen to be a fan of Twitter, if you use the hashtag textbook broke, you can see an image similar to the one on the right of the screen where students across the country are holding up whiteboards that basically said, I spent X on textbooks this year. Just to make a note in the bottom of the screen, you can see that there is a mass per. So there is a student advocacy group in Massachusetts that's also addressing student affordability concerns. Now, what Connecticut has done is we've passed a law as of this past July to explore a open education um, initiative specific to textbooks. So what we're doing is somewhat of a pilot program to do the study of what folks have adopted in the state, try to do awareness campaigns similar to this webinar, build a task force that basically can go and look at what are the opportunities to expand this, what are the obstacles, where can we create supporting policies and funding sources to enable faculty to do this, not only for their benefit, but for student affordability and student success in the end. I know that Massachusetts had a similar law on the books or, or a proposed law on the books this past legislative season, and that did not go forward. You should be aware, though, at the federal level, Dick Durbin and Al Franken have re, uh, resurrected a, an Affordable College Textbook Act. What they're trying to do is, at a federal level, provide a granting opportunity where a competitive application process would be available for institutions or faculty at institutions to embrace open, again, for not only student affordability, but for student success as well. There's an interesting website to explore at some point in time, and for any administrators on, on the, the webinar, that Lumen Learning put together. So um, quite often there's a concern of, okay, if we adopt open, we're going to impact our, our bookstore in some form or fashion. And that's going to impact the revenues that the bookstore um, realizes. There are, there's data that supports that 60% of students are going outside of your bookstore to purchase their textbooks anyway. They're probably going through fulfillment of Amazon or some other pieces. But when you look at the ability for students to reinvest financial aid dollars back into credit and that you're, re you're recovering tuition, the amount of dollars that the institution is able to retain for um, and what would it be lost tuition versus what the bookstore might potentially lose, you can see that it's a $110,000 difference in this particular um, scenario. And Kevin, so, Stephen actually had a question. Um, he wants to know if you can comment about the electronic formats in which OER are becoming available, uh, like various ebook formats, LTIs for LMSs, that sort of thing. Absolutely. So there are traditionally at the, the at the basic form you can get it in a PDF, an EPUB. Many new initiatives are being done in websites just because you can embrace HTML5, you can have a little bit more dynamic um, feel to that. Um, there are LTI connections where a LMS can integrate to a one of these OER sites and do some data exchange. Um, a great one for an example is My Open Math, which I'll show in, in just a couple of slides, is basically a competitive solution to Pearson's My, My Math Lab, My Foundations Lab, which has a zero dollar cost to it. And it does have the ability to connect back to LMSs like Blackboard or Moodle or Canvas. 
and you can actually have great exchange. So whatever they accomplish inside the My Open Math platform can funnel back to your Blackboard or Canvas or Moodle course environment. So yeah, you know, and a tool that faculty or authors are using is um, a form of um, WordPress called Pressbooks, specifically designed to author open text. Now again, remember the context here is while well, open text is, is specific to you know student affordability and, and a good chunk of how we do this, open text is just one of the many elements of open. And we're focusing on open education, and there are other, uh, there are other avenues to explore, like open journals, open access, especially in the library. So hopefully that provided a, a little context on that. So let's talk about the little of the nuts and bolts about what OER is. So I, I love this quote because it, it's it's true. Um, copyright doesn't necessarily keep up with the technology and the, the way that the internet allows us to disseminate information. But there's a little bit more to this. It's not just about disseminating, it's also about it consuming. So I made the reference before about being able to do a Google search and just being able to find any piece of information and, and and incorporate that in the, your learning. Just because Google makes it available to you doesn't necessarily mean that you have the proper copyright or permission to use that. So if we look at this slide, I think everybody in agreement would say that the post, the movie poster on the right definitely has copyright from Warner Brothers and it's fully protected and you need to have permission. Now some of you may disagree on with the image on the left that looks like it's some grade school authoring. But both of them have the same intellectual property rights around copyright. Both of them have all rights reserved. So the original author owns this unless they sell outright to a publisher or to a media outlet for permission to use that. So how do you do a permissions-based piece where you are allowed to keep your intellectual property but also grant permission for others to use that. That's where an organization like Creative Commons comes in. So Creative Commons allows a way to apply copyright permissions to your work that allows you to retain the intellectual property rights, but give folks legal permission to use it. And then what you can do is you can assign different attributes to the license. So you can just say, I'm going to just ensure that I get credit where credit's due, so I'm just going to say I just want attribution. Or if you want, you can say, look, if you can take my work, you can use it as you see fit, you can make improvements. However, if you make improvements, you have to share alike. You have to basically pay it forward and share back the improvements you made. Now, to Stephen's question before about commercial use, you can also put a restriction on there. You can say, look, I don't want this to be used for any profit. This cannot be used for commercial gain. That doesn't mean that you can't charge tuition for students to access this resource. It just means you can't resell that resource in and of itself. And the last one is no derivative works. Basically, you're saying use this work as is. Don't make any changes. Now, within the terms of open, what is the most free versus the least free? Which is the most restrictive versus the least restrictive? Commonly, you'll hear CC BY, which means just give me attributions from my work and if you can improve it, go forth and conquer. To the, le the most restrictive or least free is basically, I want attribution, I don't want this to be um, altered in any way, and you can't use it for commercial. So it really puts a restriction on how folks can use your work. In the open community, they would hope that you would use the CC BY or the CC BY SA, which is the share alike piece, just so as a community of learners or practitioners, we can improve upon our work throughout the community. So within the license structure that Creative Commons allows for, you have the ability to retain your own work, so you retain your intellectual property. You have the ability to reuse others' work. You have the ability to revise, so you can make modifications as you see fit. But the interesting one is remixing, which I alluded to before, is taking different elements that share the same copyright attribution and remixing them to, to one new piece. So taking chapters from multiple sources and combining it into a new, a, a new element. And lastly, the ability to redistribute, to basically share, share across your department, share across your institution, share across the globe. 
So these are the permissions that the Creative Commons licensing structure allows you to do. Now, this is a little bit broader stroke, but in the, in the theme of course rede redesign or course design for that matter, most folks will start in, at level zero, which is basically replace. We're going to take something that has some uh, copyright restriction or a cost or what have you, and we're going to just simply replace that. Over time, you have the ability to re realign. You may look at what your student outcomes. You may see that the existing material doesn't support to the extent that you want the learning outcome you want. And you may start implementing these open resources to better support student outcomes. And then lastly, that, that sort of Zen moment in open is rethinking the whole course design so that you're creating homework assignments that enable students to embrace open. David Wiley's from Brigham Young University. He's now one of the co-founders of Lumen Learning, and he talks about what he does in his instructional design program, where he has the students in his grad program basically work on a wiki together that has created an outcome that is a project management document or guide for specific for instructional designers. And each year, the students are required in his class to not only review what the previous classes have done, but to look at the open community as well and try to improve upon that resource. So it's a living, growing resource that is Creative Commons licensed that anybody in the globe can adopt or adapt as they see fit, but it's part of this evolution process as part of the, the rethinking of the way he designed his course. So who is using this? I, I, I mentioned, now this snapshot doesn't give justice to the number of OER initiatives that have cropped up in the last six to nine months. But you can see that there's a heavy dose on the West Coast, a heavy dose in um, Central Midwest United States. And there are a pocket of initiatives that are being done in the Northeast. UMass Amherst has a great initiative. Marilyn Billings is their librarian there. I would encourage you to reach out and talk to her. North Shore Community College, for one, is another one. And uh, Northern Essex is another that I, I'm aware of within Massachusetts. And I know that there's active conversations going on. From a, a national standpoint, I mentioned the open course library that the state of Washington did. They addressed the top 100 enrolled courses uh, across their, their body of institutions. And they said, look, we're going to create fully open courses that embrace open materials across the board, lectures, materials, assessments, and textbooks. And these are courses that anyone can go and adapt and adopt as they see fit for zero cost. We mentioned Cal State's efforts. They not only have the Merlot repository, but they also have something that's called the Affordable Learning Solutions. What's unique about the Affordable Learning Solution is it has an ISBN search piece. If you put in your textbook, your ISBN number, and search on that, it'll give you results that are related to that topic that could be a flat out replacement OER textbook or supplemental materials that supports the commercial textbook that you're using. So it's a great tool. University of Minnesota has done the open textbook library piece and they've partnered with a number of regional institutions including um, a consortia out of British Columbia, BC campus, around creating a nice series of textbooks that have been vetted and then an interesting program out of Virginia is Tidewater Community College has a program called the Z Degree. They have a full program, a business program, that has zero textbook costs. And the students basically tag this program as the Z Degree, and it's become a, a, somewhat of a national model that folks have replicated. And I really, um, I, I guess, a huge effort is University of Maryland, University College, what they have is an initiative going right now to eliminate all textbooks, publisher textbooks, commercial textbooks, from all undergrad uh, programs throughout the university. They're about 80% done with that, and when they finish that, they're going to tackle their graduate programs. And this is just a, a, a quick synopsis of just a, a couple. There are so many different initiatives, programs, and repositories out there. So here's another one um, that I like to, to highlight. So Maricopa Community College. I mentioned, you know, no one likes to talk about students as consumers, but this is a great story. So what Maricopa did is any faculty member that was adopting low cost, no cost solutions, they were making a, a record or a note of it within their 
their, their course catalog inside their student information system. So what we, they were seeing, though, is that students were starting to make decisions based on textbook or material costs. And they were starting to see high enrollment in certain sections that were open and lower enrollments and in uh, sections that were doing traditional textbooks. Well, sort of the natural evolution of pieces is you basically have an, a faculty member who looks at either not getting enough students to run the section using the traditional textbook or adopting open so that they can continue to run that section. So this is one of those examples where you see you know, students as consumers having an impact on how the institution and the faculty is delivering the content. Quick success story out of Connecticut. Um, I mentioned the My Open Math um, tool set. Housatonic Community College is out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. They have a lot of students that are going through remedial math or uh, intermediate or, or elementary math around algebra. And they were using Pearson solution, a combination of a Pearson textbook along with My Foundations Lab. And what it was on average was about $260 per student. What they did is they adopted the My Open Math Lab tool, which is zero cost, and they adopted a textbook that Scottsdale, Arizona's community college um, department created called Math AS. And it was a zero cost textbook if you used it digitally, but if you wanted it printed, it was about $30. So just in this, this initiative across uh, about a handful of sections, they went from a $260 student cost to a $30 student cost. So a net savings of $230 per student. And just within the one year with only three faculty adopting it across their sections, they were able to save their students over $200. Now there's some additional data that they've provided. They do have great foresight to sort of track student outcomes. And what they saw across the board is that students perform the same, if not better, from Pearson's materials to the open materials. And Kevin, Stephen has a question. Is there a preconceived notion among, among instructors that using OER in course redesign and design uh, will take a lot of extra time? And how to persuade those that see it in that way? And then are there cost savings, um, are cost savings the preliminary persuasive reason? So let me talk the first part. Uh, you know, whether there's precon preconceived notions, it really depends from institution to institution. So I, I don't necessarily want to say that, but I'll address, yes, um, it will take extra time. If you have a set curriculum in place and you've been using it for an extended period of time, yes, anytime you're going to go and review new materials and then you're going to take the time to replace those, there is going to be a, a, an investment of time for the review and the implementation. Now, depending on the institution policies, a lot of institutions have a course review cycle where a course will go through some type of um, pedagogical review or structural review every two years or, or so. And some institutions are using that opportunity to add open to the review process. So not only are they looking at about accessibility, they're also looking at student outcomes, but they're sort of intertwining open in that process. Now, Many of the successful OER initiatives have had some funding source. So there have traditionally been faculty stipends to support and potentially entice faculty to exploring this because it, it, it is effort. Now, is primary saving is, is student savings the primary reason for this? It depends on the institution. It really does. You know, all students, all institutions have students that are benefiting from financial aid, and the financial aid is, is an impact. But from an individual faculty standpoint, if you can look at OER and you can say, this particular site will provide supplemental instruction that will enhance student engagement and improve student outcomes, and it's a zero cost sum, so it's no net new cost to that, go forth and conquer. But if you're starting to see your students come unprepared to class, they're not buying their textbooks, or that the textbook in and of itself isn't producing the results or, sup or supporting materials that you see, you're doing a two for. Not only are you saving students money, but you're also improving student engagement and, and outcomes. One of the, the battle cries is when you look at the 
quality of materials that are out there over the last five years in the OER spectrum, it's hard to say that the commercial materials are that much better, if at all, and for the money. So instead of saying, are OER good enough to meet commercial, it should really be flipped around and say, it, what's the value prop here? Is the commercial textbook that much better than an open alternative for the price that my student is going to per, have to be purchased, knowing that 60% of students at some point in time in their collegiate experience aren't going to buy the textbook and they're going to be unprepared. So it's a long-winded answer, but it's, it's a very nuanced and it's a very personal decision from faculty to faculty to department to department, institution to institution. So I wanted to do equal time. So I did, you know, I showed a Connecticut success story. I wanted to talk a little bit about Northern Essex Community College. And since we just talked about, you know, sort of faculty incentive, how they started their project is they came, their academic affairs department said, look, I'm going to put $5,000 into the pot and you're going to do a competitive application process. And we're going to give each faculty member $1,000 to go and review and embrace open. And that $5,000 basically netted $56,000 of student savings. And then based on the outcomes that those faculty were seeing, they would share their story. The institution would see where they could find other sources of revenue to enhance and support. So over the last two plus years, Northern Essex has only committed less than $20,000 investment through grants or their own funding to support over 37 sections of OER. And if you look at their net savings to date, it's over 300,000 and they're looking to go close to a half a million dollars next year. And their investment has been less than $20,000. So it's not that you have to make this a larger than life initiative. It can be a handful of faculty who want to embrace this, who want to look at an innovative way to do this. And it doesn't necessarily have to be student savings. Really, it's about student outcomes, student success. And if the cost is a barrier to student success, then that's a win as well. So I want to run through just some of the, the repositories or resources that are available for you. So I talked a little bit about um, Rice University's OpenStax college program. And they've solely focused on high quality textbooks that have that sustainability model built in. So these are going through a rev cycle on a consistent basis. There's the Open Text Library um, initiative that I mentioned that University of Minnesota is doing in collaboration with other institutions. There's the Cal State ISBN search. This is part of their affordable learning solutions. Um, um, so with Northern Essex, the numbers were um, cumulative over time. So from fall 2014 to present, so within a little over a year's time, they've saved $300,000. So um, going forward, they're expecting to go another $150,000 to $200,000 in savings next year as they, they fan out to more faculty. So um, I mentioned Cal State's ISBN search piece. So there are so many things out there. So how do you start? And what we're doing today is really talking about awareness. Some of you may have had a good foundation to this, and I'm, what I'm saying is old hat. Some of this may be brand new to you, and you didn't know that you had resources available to you free of cost. Successful initiatives have always had multiple entities or multiple agents throughout the institution involved, especially the library. Librarians are key to longstanding um, success of these programs. They're going to help faculty curate and reduce the number of assets. Globally speaking, there's over 500 billion assets that are openly licensed. So it can be a bit daunting, but if you focus on the major three or four repositories and you're using your library support to help filter that down to your specific topic or subject area, it becomes much more manageable. So we're talking about fa faculty education and, and how do they embed this, how, you know, how do they go through the review process. But at some point in time, there has to be student engagement. Because if, if there is a concern with your student body about the, co the cost or, you know, just affordable um, college experience, you don't necessarily want them to start protesting when you're actually working towards their benefit. So at some point in time, you want to bring them into the conversation because you may get some interesting detail. Your student population may be more tech-centric. 
they may want a physical textbook versus digital. So that would factor into your whole strategy. So funding, again, the Northern Essex, they started with $5,000 of internal money and then they pulled some money from different funding uh, source of grant funding. And those professional development funds allow faculty the release time to go and look at these resources, evaluate them, see if the, the outcomes or, or the, yeah, the student outcomes will align what they're doing and supports experimentation. So playing with these, seeing if they can go and revise something. At some point in time, you're going to need administrative support. There are going to be policy decisions or policy changes that need to happen to really fully support faculty. I'm not even, I don't necessarily want to go into detail because every institution is different around tenure, promotion, release time. Um, but those types of conversations are going to need to be had at some level. And then knowing that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts proposed legislation this past year around OER, you should have that in the background that there's this federal effort through that Affordable College Textbook Act and that the state in and of itself has tried to produce legislature. So there, there is this awareness across the globe about this. And lastly, there is a Northeast OER consortium that's present throughout Northeast, New England and beyond. So CTDLC is one of the founding members of it. The Mass College is online, UMass Online, SUNY, and a number of other institutions are basically supporting this regional effort around workshops, around training opportunities, about data collection, and all of these things. So if you have a champion at Brandeis, we'd love to have them join the conversation and learn more. So, you know, this is, there's so much out there. There's so much work that's already been done. It can seem overwhelming, but really start small. From a campus-wide perspective, you can only you can start with just one or two faculty that maybe are collaborating within a, a given department. You can start at a department level piece. It doesn't have to be an institutional effort. The best way to, to get your toes wet is really to look at what's already out there in a sustainable model. So OpenStax is a great place to look. Merlot, even Lumen Learning or the open textbook pieces, where these are resources that are heavily adopted across the globe and have a support base and making sure that they're updated and revised on a regular basis. And then down the road, you look, you can look for grants because the federal government, the Obama administration, um, the, the, the Commonwealth's legislature, everybody's pushing towards this initiative in some form or fashion. There are granting agencies, whether it's the Hewlett Foundation, Gates, 20 Million Minds, um, you name it, there are funding agencies who are willing to help with this. I mentioned that library is key to this. So is your instructional design support so that you don't necessarily have to take this full burden of how do I integrate these OER resources and give proper citation back. And by nature, OER is this community at large. So it, it helps to be making, working in teams, cross-departmental, cross-functional teams so that everybody's aware and everybody's celebrating in success and remembering that it doesn't have to be replacement. It can be augmentation. It can be supplementing. And at the end, if you can't find something that addresses your specific need, take something and modify it or build it from scratch. So just uh, quickly here, there are a number of resources that I would embrace folks to, or encourage folks to go. Khan Academy has a bunch of YouTube um, videos that are specific to math, my open math. Um, again, uh, we'll make this slide presentation available so nobody has to scribble down as quickly as they can. But I do want to address some of these in a rapid format because I think we're at the 10 minute mark here. I've talked at length about my open math being a Pearson, my, found, my math lab, my foundations um, competitor or alternate and it's, it's, it's globally adopted, so it's a strong um, resource for you. Many of the web-based solutions that are out there have Creative Commons filters or search engines. So Flickr, if you're looking for images, you can do a Creative Commons search by license. So if you're looking for something that only ha requires attribution, you can do that. YouTube has a Creative Commons filter as well, so you can find resources that have already been Creative Commons licensed for your use. 
there are major repositories like OER Commons, which is a great one because it breaks down not only by subject area, grade level, but also material type. Creative Commons itself also has this federated search engine where you can search in something and you can select the different um, resources that you want to search for that particular topic. And then if you've ever used Google search, and I don't know who hasn't, if you've ever wondered what that little gear symbol is up in the upper right hand corner, it gives you to advanced search functions. And once you get to that page in the bottom portion, you have the ability to filter by usage rights. And usage rights basically align to the Creative Commons license structure. So you can actually search for items that have been licensed, free to use, share, modify, or even commercially. So that's your CC BY or CC attribute license structure. I mentioned the Northeast OER Consortium. Our focus is really around professional development, providing models um, that are either template standards or exemplar works just to support what those are. And lastly, is really around data collection. Not that we're going to go back and do anything you know, nefarious with this information, but we want to play sort of a, a match.com. So if we know that there's a Connecticut faculty member that's working on something innovative in math, well, now Massachusetts faculty can go and connect with that. If there's somebody part of the SUNY system who's doing something innovative in the business field, we want to have the ability to have that data together so we can connect folks and collaborate and be available for multi-state grant opportunities. So I wanted to leave um, as much time as I could. Um, so what questions can I answer for you? And it Let's looks like here. Valerie um, had a long question. <laughs> Um, she just wanted to say, thanks so much, Kevin. This was really helpful. At Brandeis GPS, I would love to encourage our instructors to adopt more OER to supplement their textbooks and online course materials. Uh, this is in addition to promoting the use of Brandeis online library resources as well. She says, I think our faculty would be very interested but may not know where to start or how to uh, vet the resources to be sure they are appropriate, uh, if they're peer reviewed, et cetera. Do you have any suggestions on how to engage faculty? Should we be, um, should we start with simply promoting the repositories? Uh, it may seem overwhelming to faculty, I imagine, to try to sort through all the OERs to find the right resources for their class. What I've seen successful is campuses that are interested in embracing OER have put together an opt-in committee. So you have interested folks who want to come to, to the table to learn more and see how they can help. And, and cross-functional support would always be great. And if you have um, a librarian who wants to champion this, that's going to be critical to this. What I would recommend as sort of that first step is Merlot. Um, because Merlot really is that peer-reviewed, user-reviewed material. It has a broad adoption piece. It allows for multiple um, material types. So it isn't just going to be only textbooks like OpenStax. It's going to have images. It's going to have lectures. It's going to have a number of things. But even then, there are a number of resources in there. But the peer review does help in that in that manner. So you know, I'd also offer my time to come up and lead you know a a you know one hour discussion with the inter interested folks around you know strategy as simple as it can be. So I think if you can get a critical mass who are interested in learning more and do a little bit of exploration and what questions they may have and you can have the library in the middle of this, you know, I'd be more than happy to, I know that Marilyn Billings from UMass Amherst has been visiting a number of campuses. There's an organization that supports libraries called Spark. Nicole Allen is a national figure on OER. She comes throughout the region and talks to folks Mary Lou Ford represents the OER Consortium. I believe she's based in New Hampshire. So we have a lot of regional folks who can come in and support the conversation. This is really great, Kevin. Um, I know just from a student standpoint, uh, just in reference to a slide that you showed earlier about the statistics of uh, student success with, in reference to the cost of textbooks, I know just from personal experience, in looking at a class and knowing that, oh, I have to spend $400 on textbooks, I actually opted not to take that class. So had I known at that point in time that there were other options, uh, 
cheaper options for me, um, it would have been a little bit better. So just speaking from a standpoint, that that one slide really spoke to me. Yeah, and from you know, and not that necessarily that this is the, the an approach that you want to uh, embrace as an institution, but a lot of folks are using this as a marketing vehicle. UMUC is getting a lot of national attention because they're basically making their undergrad programs textbook free. So, you know, the the common statistic that's thrown out is students spend on average about $1,200 a, a year on textbooks, $600 a semester. So if you're able to save a student, you know, around $1,000 per year that can be reinvested into other institution functions, whether it's, you know, paying for other credits or, or other pieces, you know, it has a, a nice feel-good story that students aren't necessarily having their state-funded financial aid go outside of the, the um, outside of the state, that it's getting reinvested into the institution in some form or fashion versus going to, you know, a $1 billion industry or a multi-billion dollar industry in, in, in commercial textbooks. We have time. Uh, if there's anyone else that has uh, one more question, I think we can sneak in a quick question here. If there's anyone else that has one. All right. Um, so just a, a little brief recap um, or introduction to what Brandeis GPS is all about. Um, here on the screen you'll see a list of our 10 100% online master's degree programs, uh, which all offer applied skills that can be used directly in the workplace. Um, all programs are 10 courses, 30 credits, and they're part-time. This fall, uh, Brandeis GPS kicked off with two new programs, Digital Marketing and Design and User-Centered Design. Um, and then make sure to also connect with us through social media. Uh, make sure to subscribe to our blog to stay up to date on special events like today's webinar, uh, job posting spotlights that we do on Mondays, as well as networking opportunities. So Kevin, on behalf of everyone here at Graduate Professional Studies, we want to thank you so much for presenting today. And we also want to thank everyone out there for attending our webinar this afternoon. So thank you so much. I'm more than happy to be part of this and any other future conversations. I do want to say one other thing is that the Northeast OER Consortium is actively working on a spring workshop. So as soon as that those details have been um, solidified, I'll let Lindsay and company know and let you all know. Um, most likely it'll happen, it'll be held at um, UMass Shrewsbury uh, campus, so uh, within driving distance for folks. This is really great information. Thank you so much. And uh, that wraps up our special event webinar. So thank you, everyone. And again, thank, uh, Kevin, a big thank you for uh, leading today's webinar. Uh, have a great day, folks, and enjoy the rest of your lunch hour here. And uh, We'll, I'll be sending out the recording most likely tomorrow morning to everyone. Thank you.